I'll give you an example, right? Like everyone wants an engineer who's done coding at Google for more than six years, even if they're hiring a junior engineer and they're gleaning this information on, right, does this person have the right schools? Does this person have the right experience in terms of the place they've worked before? Have they worked for X number of years? And all of that is noise. Today we're talking to Applied and discussing why the CV is past its sell-by date and how initially it puts bias into a process before any human decisions get made. This is Tech Talks, your twice-weekly technology podcast where we interview leaders from across the industry and bring you a little bit of technology news. I'm your host David Savage and it's powered by the Harvey Nash Group. Joining me today we've got Amber. Uh, Amber, whenever you're on the podcast you seem to be mildly worse for wear. I know, you know, I was actually thinking this, I was like, it must look terrible because every time I come on here, I just, I've been out the night before and it just looks like I just regularly go out on a Thursday night, which I don't, but I always seem to come onto the podcast the next morning. You don't? I, no, actually I don't, to be fair, but it, um, okay. yeah, it just seems like I come on the podcast every time I do. So people are probably thinking there's a bit of a pattern occurring here. And you went out for uh, tapas? I did, yeah, I did. Best, was... best dish? Uh, oh, do you know what? I just love Padron peppers. Like, I just keep it simple. Like, yeah, I'm a big fan. There is nothing wrong with simple but good flavours. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. It's weird, though, because I'm really good with, with like, heat and spices, and mm. I didn't think they were spicy at all. But other people thought they were really spicy, and apparently, like, one in eight peppers are spicy. Have you ever heard that before? Or did someone just say that and I'm really gullible and I've believed it? I've never had a spicy powder on pepper. The no, whole point is, no not. neither have I. But someone was like... They're mild enough, and salted and... Yeah. Someone was like um, near enough like tearing up because he said it was that spicy. But... My gut feeling is that they're just they're just wrong or they, <laughs> they just were giving an excuse. I don't know. That, that, that would be weird. Yeah, can't handle their but, heat. As we're going to discuss in today's podcast, gut feeling can obviously sometimes be a little bit misleading. So there's the most tenuous link I've ever found. Uh, Today's interview is with Kiati, the CEO of Applied. We'll go to that interview now uh, and then we'll come back with some commentary afterwards. Today I'm talking to Kiati, the CEO of Applied. How are you this morning? I'm really well, David. Thanks for having me here. No problems. Uh, CEO, founder as well, co-founder, or, or just CEO who's been brought in? Just CEO who's been brought in. It's a very interesting non-linear journey. I joined Applied uh, 2019 as the chief mm-hmm. product officer and was promoted to CEO within 12 months, which happened to be first? which happened to be a couple of months before the pandemic. So that was fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, your first CEO role? Or? No, I have started a company previously where I was the co-founder and CEO. So this is my second CEO role. How does it differ being the CEO of a business you've co-founded versus being the CEO of a business where you've been brought in to specifically do that task? It's not very different in my mind. I am. Okay. I have a mixed bag in terms of background. I've done economics, finance. I fundraising started my own company and I think all of those skills add to the breadth of expertise that you need to run a business so it's not different and that said uh, mm-hmm. but I think there is an additional pressure as a founder when you've started the company on you know bring on the vision lead the people uh, but when you're as small as us we're 30 people right now going on to become 30 people um, it's still very much the same set of challenges so not, yeah. not very different, I'd say. So before we get into anything else, uh, we've mentioned that you are working as applied. Uh, who are they? Aside from being a, an organisation who are moving on to 30 people, what does the business do? So applied pushes back against outdated hiring practices that perpetuate bias. We are re-architecting the whole process and we empower leaders to create the best teams. So you can think of it as a framework for running the most predictive assessments to shortlist candidates and then removing all noise, bias and extraneous information from that process such that each and every time you make the best decision for your company. In what sectors or can it be applied to any sector, any kind of skill set? 
It's across the board. We've helped multiple kinds of industries and sectors from um, consulting to government to construction. It works beautifully well for knowledge heavy, you know, white collar jobs. So any kind of jobs that you can test on skills, we can do it. So someone listening might say, well, why do we need to re-engineer or re-architect the hiring process? Well, that's really interesting. I'm glad you asked that. And I'll, I'll step back. What do leaders of today really care about? They should care about two things. They should care about creating a world-class hiring process that gets them the best teams, so high-performing teams, and two, gets them the most diverse teams. Now, we have two problems in our current processes that prevents us from achieving that. Problem number one is there is barely any data, right? There is no data, if at all limited, to tell us what good looks like in hiring. Hiring has not been innovated in 100, 200 years. All of our processes look the same, even though the needs of the organizations and our society looks very different. Problem number two is all of the current processes we know are perpetuating historic outcomes and biases. So there is extraneous information, whether you look at a CV, a resume, a LinkedIn profile, a lot of information that sits there gives me no signal as to whether this person is the right person for that job. I'll give you an example, right? Like everyone wants an engineer who's done coding at Google for more than six years, even if they're hiring a junior engineer. And they're gleaning this information on, right, does this person have the right schools? Does this person have the right experience in terms of the place they've worked before? Have they worked for X number of years? And all of that is noise. And this is backed by data and science. This is backed by over 50 years of research that tells us all of that is noise. It's not predictive. So what is happening is those two problems are intertwining and giving us a consequence, which is we're quite often not building the best teams. And I'm going to take it far and say, if we get the right teams, we're lucky because we're not using data to tell us what the right thing is. And on top of that, we're making opportunities and inaccessible for millions across the globe because you're not testing on talent, you're testing on proxies of talent. Okay, so I agree with this. And I, I also find it interesting because I'm, I'm an ex-hands-on contract technology recruiter. And my question has always been, fine, totally get it, you're right. But saying that someone has previously implemented Salesforce and you're looking for someone who can implement Salesforce is a measurable thing. You can, you can kind of look at it and go, okay, that person's done it. So that organization can, can probably bring this person in on a, on a fairly low risk basis to do it for them. If you, and, and, I, and I get that that then begins to bring those historical biases into the process. If we begin to ignore that, and if we take your example and we go, right, you don't have to have had X many years at Google because the market's really bloody difficult to find someone and it might be that might be actually making it very hard for you to bring anyone in through the door anyway how do you measure someone because there has to be some kind of quality control into all right hang on what does this what does the person need to look like that we bring into the organization if you throw away that empiric yes no have they done this how do you measure someone when there is pressure on time to hire and there are so many candidates out there and you need to be able to differentiate between them somehow Brilliant question. Yes. Uh, it is an undeniably nuanced challenge, right? Finding the right team, right, best, great, it's all normative, but you're right. How do we match people? And applied cares about the quality of match. So if I zoom out from the problem, we are actually proving that this works, right? The proof is in the pudding. Mm -hmm. We can say that of all of the hires done by applied, and now we've had over 400,000 applications, hired about 10,000 people. This is all across the globe. We can say that our first year retention rates are much better. In fact, our turnover rates are 5x lower than UK benchmarks. And that is the quality of the match. We care about matching people who are absolutely right for the job and will sit longer in the role and perform better in the role over time. 
right? And now I'm going back to your question about experience and proxies of talent. In the example that you chose, it's, it's a perfect example because you could say, actually, that's Salesforce is a very specific niche skill that I want, and that's perfectly legitimate, and you should ask all of your candidates the same question and test everybody on Salesforce implementation, and that can be a skill. But if a person has acquired Salesforce implementation as a skill working at Google or somewhere else, it doesn't matter. If they've acquired that in two years versus five years, it should not matter. And what you're testing for is objectively the skill that they're bringing to your organization rather than what they look like on paper. And we're just saying all of the stuff that we actually test on today is proxy. And if you were to shift the lens on talent, you can test on skill but glean the information that matters, which is in that particular instance, Salesforce implementation. So how does it look when you implement the product into an organization? Because typically the, the traditional thing is obviously like, you know, uh, you've got a, a, a situation where maybe you've got an internal talent team or you're working with an external partner, like a recruitment organization and a hiring manager receives 10 CVs on their desk and they kind of look through them and at that point, bias will creep into the process. In fact, it's already crept into the process from the internal recruiter and, and, or, or the external partner. But how, how does the product fit into this process to try and tackle some of those inherent issues coming in immediately? So the first thing, we advise you not to use CVs. They are mm -hmm. just renditions of the past. The first CV was created back in 1400s and it's not fit for purpose anymore. Um, applied is a behavioral solution to a behavioral problem. We're changing the environment in which you take a decision. So you can think of it as, again, a framework that guardrails you such that biases don't creep in. And how do we do this in practice? In short, step number one, test candidates on what really matters. So it's not a pile of CVs landing on your desk if you're the internal talent team. You're going into your app and in our app and thinking of skills and skills being a catch-all term for you know attitude in, in your example some kind of previous experience of implementation of certain products per se um, and you can think of that that's the building blocks we can help you with as well if you put in a job description we match and predict skills that are required for that job for example so the building blocks start with skills, then the system can predict the kinds of assessments and questions you can ask based on that skill. Um, and there's, these are highly predict predictive questions that we have built over the course of the last five years. Um, so that's step number one. What happens on the flip side is once the talent team has done this, it goes out to the candidates. And the candidates are witnessing a completely different experience than what is the norm. So there are no CVs to upload, there are no forms to fill. You are literally, as a candidate, answering three to five questions, which are predictive questions testing you for exactly those skills in a very objective manner. And once the candidate has answered these, it then goes to a panel of reviewers in the organization. And that's when the behavioral science mitigation kicks in uh, that's when we start anonymizing all these answers that have been written by the candidates, but we don't stop at the anonymization. We do several other mitigation processes, such as, such as randomizing all these answers to prevent ordering effects, which is a behavioral phenomena that we see where um, if you people who submit applications towards the end of the process are going to get uh, scored harshly. So there are lots of different kinds of behavioral phenomena that will enable biases to creep in. And that's just inadvertent. That happens to all of us. And we are providing the guardrails so that you can take the best decision, knowing that your gut is not interfering in the process. Um, so that's, that's, all, sorry, that's all of the initial stage of the process, right? Are you, are you replacing the interview itself? Yes. So that's the initial stage, which is the selection and the sorting. Once... Yeah. All that happens, we give you a predictive, anonymized leaderboard of the top talented candidates. Yeah. And then so, we run and, interviews as well. Yeah, because I was going to say, look, interviews, again, are a place where bias can creep in. So how do you tackle that? Because, for example, and let, let's take a really 
random example, but I think it's a great one, um, in the music world where you have auditions for um, people, you know, say, 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 to give an example that I know of that's happened very recently because my brother-in-law is a musician, the Northern Symphonia is looking for a flautist and they don't want to uh, bias who they pick. So they invite a whole lot of people for, for an audition uh, and then they play behind a screen so that the people who are making the decision on the player have no idea of the, of the gender, of the ethnicity, of the age. Um, some people should, should question, you know, should, should uh, men and women be asked to walk into the room removing their shoes so that heels don't potentially give away gender, perhaps? Um, but, you know, there is that kind of like, right, we're going we're gonna to put some physical barrier there so that it's just purely based on that person's playing ability and interpretation of the music versus anything else. How do you do that yeah. in the world of an engineer? Yeah, you're speaking to very famous studies that have been run, right? The Celia Russo study was the origination of this exact thing, that orchestra, um, how do you hire and do blind auditions in orchestra, which goes back to the 1960s. But you're absolutely right. That is an extreme manifestation in a place where mm. you don't need to hear someone's voice. You don't need to hear, uh, if it was a sales role, for example, you need them to be credible in front of, uh, clients so you need to be able to see how they pitch yeah so taking the music example that is a very extreme example and manifestation of behavioral science and how you remove all sorts of extraneous information but we've started on that process with our interviews the very first step is at least ask structured questions and again going back to research if you structure questions, i.e. you prepare the questions in advance, all of the candidates are asked the same questions. It's not like a fireside chat that can be subjective. You have prepared in advance rubric that marks each of the candidates objectively. You're already starting to chip away at biases that prevent that. Right? I've seen people where I go like, oh, I didn't really like the way he shook my hand, so I'm not going to call him for the next interview. You are not going to start um, removing biases completely but we've started on that journey is where applied is and the next step is of course how do we make it much much better no technology is perfect as it emerges right we're on a iteration path and we are going to keep improving so we can mitigate biases to the extent possible but what i what i want to bring us back is it's already 100 times better than the status quo and that's what matters because we're we're on a path and we're improving what exists so the, the last question I wanted to ask, and, and, and that we're replacing what exists is a great lead into this. Um, you are fighting uphill against uh, a deluge of, of an industry going in the other direction. I mean, look, LinkedIn adverts on the television, that advert with the, with, the, with the guy who's growing a plant in his window, and it's kind of growing your network. And LinkedIn is basically, it's a digital CV. It looks pretty much like a CV, a LinkedIn profile. So how do you, how do you capture enough talent into your system to do this in your new way that re-architects the, the talent hiring process to a to a volume that gives an organization the confidence that you're going to give them the breadth of the candidates they need to be able to grow their business <laughs> since you picked linkedin i'm going to share an anecdote uh, we've been able to see and, and i think this is quite wide knowledge that programma programmatic advertising for job ads is not necessarily working in the way it was supposed mm -hmm. to, right? So I have examples where we know a job ad, let's say it was targeted at men and women of a certain age, but the models were built such that it was optimizing for cost, right? So can I put the cheapest ads out possible to get as many people to see the ad? therein lies the solution to the volume question, right? Get the ad out as wide as possible for the cheapest cost possible. Now, mm. once the model has been built to optimize for costs, we started seeing that the ads were not being shown to women. Now it's discriminatory to women, not because the model was built to be discriminatory to women, but because women are more expensive to advertise to. So the model learns and adapts and starts doing what it was optimized to do, right? To, to solve for cost, not solve for volumes. And I think this is a very nuanced example as to it's not an easy challenge 
to solve yeah. for. It needs years and years of iteration and learning and understanding how we build these kinds of models for volume. But the other flip side is I can actually argue that volume is not the right thing to do. Right? The entire industry of HR is actually based on let's get number of people in and they are pipe, they fit into the pipeline. And if you had 100 people in the pipeline, I know for certain that I'll get three people in the door at the interview stage. And that's what it's optimized for. It's optimized for the funnel falling off at different points of time. And what Applied is doing is flipping that script. We're saying it doesn't matter how many people you get at the top of the funnel, as long as there are every time you do an interview, there are three more people than you would have thought who would walk in the door who are better suited for your job than you would have otherwise thought. And we can we can show that again in our data. Um, every time we've got to the interview stage, there are three X the number of offers out there than were previously planned for because every individual that comes through to the interview stage is exceptional because we've matched them really highly on the skills. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm, because any problem, you can come at it from different angle. The volume question is, is, is so difficult. You can come at it from any angle. At applied, we say, don't bother with the volumes, which is easy in a way, but really hard in a way because you're challenging the status quo. Um, and I always say, like, no risk, no reward. So... Look, I think this is fascinating. I'm sure that there's plenty of hiring managers and perhaps chief people officers and, and heads of talent listening going, oh, okay, who could have thought? Um, so look, I really appreciate you giving some time this morning, Kiati. Uh, I hope that you enjoy the weekend, given that we're recording on Friday. And uh, fingers crossed that, that the service begins to, to kind of catch on and rolls out across the industry. Thanks, David. It's such a pleasure talking to you. Right, Amber, you're a recruiter. You've got to have listened to this and gone, hmm, do I agree? Do I disagree? How do I feel about this? Yeah, I did. Um, it's really strange, isn't it? Because I think like, I think you raised quite a few like good points and obviously some good questions in there as well that I was sort of like thinking myself because I think obviously, you, you know, there, there is going to be bias in that process 100% and the fact that they're trying to, you know, cancel that out and, um, you know, sort of trying to sort of destigmatize the process is amazing, but I think I, I don't know. I, I I think it's so sort of set in its ways almost, isn't it? Like you know, people have a CV for an interview, people have a LinkedIn profile, as you said, which is obviously reflective of their experience. Naturally, if you're going to interview someone, you might look onto their first. Uh, I don't know. It's just a way that it's been done for such a long time. It's trying to sort of break those patterns and those habits. But I think. You know, I mean, I looked at their website and stuff, sort of had a look through and obviously a lot of the stuff she was saying, like it does seem as though it's it's working and people are kind of embracing this sort of this new way of doing things. But um, I also kind of like what you said about like the the band and like the screen. It, like I was just, oh yeah, I was just, I was sort of amazed by that to be honest, because I thought I've never heard of that. And I, it's, it's strange, you can't really do that in an interview process, but if you could, like, again, it would sort of cut out all of this sort of this bias in the process. But then Kiyazi kind of talks about the fact that you kind of can do it in an interview process. If you get some, someone to anonymously answer questions and then you take each question and answer on merit in isolation and you can mix it up so you don't, you're not going like, right, candidate A's answers, candidate B, candidate C, but you go, which is the best answer to this question? And it's randomized. Which is the best answer to this question? It's randomized. You can begin to step away and 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 that to be fair there's part of me that's like i think we should get rid of cvs yes but how do you do that practically that's hard mm. and there was even the admission that obviously if you want someone who who has the experience of implementing salesforce it's very difficult to kind of to kind of move away from from something that goes here's a bit of experience that you're looking for that proves i can do the thing that you want me to do yeah but that way of, of, of looking at answers to questions, 100% is something that organizations could implement at any level in any job. Mm. Yeah, I think um, it is, it, it, like you say, it is a difficult one when you need such like specific experience to try to get away from that. Because without that, I mean, how, like say, how do you just sort of kind of weave that into the process if you sort of invite someone to an interview and then obviously they don't have it you're kind of back at square one because you're like oh 
like this guy, you know, it's kind of not ticking the boxes in that sense. But yeah, but you could you could ask all of the questions, the technical questions, the competency questions up front, and then go, you know what? It's going to be difficult to to ever take bias completely out of a process, right? And and you could you could argue that you do all of those bits, and then you go as a final stage. Let's bring them into the organisation. But I think at that stage, it's a case of there's got to be some real red flags when we meet that person as to why we then don't make that hire. Yeah. Like if you then don't make that hire, it's like, well, why? If they've gone through all the process and they've got the competencies and they've got the experience and we think they can do the job, what is it that's telling us that we're now going to say no? But you still have that handbrake if you feel it's absolutely necessary. Um, and equally, we do want to meet – I do think, you know, we want to meet people that we're going to work with. Yeah. And that that is biased, but – doesn't necessarily mean it's inherently bad no i agree because i think if you don't meet someone like you say everything might be ticking the boxes in the sense of like yes they can do the job but are they going to have like the right attitude are they going to be like collaborative can you work well with this this person because some people are amazing at their jobs but with other people they just might not kind of gel and that's nothing against that individual or the person that is hiring it's it's just you know that might be a, a team kind of thing they just they just don't work well together and equally the one thing that i think that this doesn't cater for is that last stage bit where actually there is an element of does the candidate want to work with you yeah yeah that's very true because i i always say that to candidates it's it's kind of a two-way process isn't it like yes they're interviewing you and yes they're going to have all the sort of the questions and be sort of you know navigating that and sort of driving that but Equally, like you said, you have to ask yourself the question, like, do I want to work here? Do I like these people? So it's very much, it kind of works on both sides, doesn't it? But I think, like you say, I, I do, I think that moving away from CVs is a good way to go. Um, I've had interviews in the past, actually, like a, a long time ago, where they didn't use a CV. And it almost, it's kind of weird because it almost makes you work harder because there's no, like, if someone has the CV in front of them, it's kind of like a prompt, isn't it? They sort of, they have the information, they ask you questions and then it kind of, yeah, it just sort of like prompts you to sort of to start that conversation and give a bit more detail. Whereas if there's nothing there and they just say, right, you tell us about your experience and you walk us through that, you have got to work a bit harder and you've got to try and sell yourself in a sense because there's just nothing to kind of fall back on. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think it's a good idea. Like I said, I think just it's it's a difficult kind of step to to make. Yeah. Like it's it's, it's bold, it, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's good what they're doing, but it is tricky to completely remove that from a process. I mean, there's part of me, right, that thinks that in our own organisation within Harvey Nash Group, when we're taking on new starters who don't, you know, who don't have any experience of recruitment, mm. why the hell are we using CVs? Because we should be hiring on potential, like we yeah. should. I've taken on a, an intern this summer. I didn't have a look at her experience because it didn't matter because it was all about has she got the ability to, assimilate information to learn how does she display enthusiasm a piece of paper isn't going to tell me any of that mm. and it's kind of the same when we hire for our teams no i completely agree i think there are certain jobs like you say when someone's coming in without experience this job obviously for example where it, it very much just comes down to like the work ethic the you know you know confidence communication skills all those sort of things something that you just can't pick up from a piece of paper so yeah, I think sometimes it's a lot easier, but then I think when we go back to the example, like the Salesforce job, when it's really specific, really niche skills, yes, obviously you can do like a technical test and stuff, but just having that there, first of all, it does make that kind of that process a little bit easier. But I suppose if you want to cut out the bias, then obviously it's not going to necessarily be easier, but obviously it is going to be a better, more diverse or sort of well-shaped process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back in a moment, we'll talk about the return to an office and a hybrid environment because, you know, it's not been discussed enough. A couple of years ago, Michael and Jacob, two friends from London, were both thinking about their consumption and sustainability as a whole. Michael, a professional footballer at the time, realised he had no options when it came to sustainable sportswear. Overconsumption and underuse was all too common. Hilo was born a sportswear brand fighting for the planet by changing mindsets. They started with a running shoe made with seven natural materials, and the shoe can be recycled at the end of its life. As a company, they've offset their carbon to beyond zero, making them carbon negative. You can find out more about Hilo and support their mission at hiloathletics.com. That's H-Y-L-O. We support the Hilo movement. 
Right, we were both in London yesterday. We both have been out eating in London over the last two days. And you know what? It's really nice. And I think it's really nice because there's a little bit of a buzz about town. You go to like the little areas where people congregate and there is an atmosphere. But you walk around and it doesn't feel hectic. It feels like people are actually quite happy to be there because they're not being forced to be there every single day, right? Yeah, yeah I completely agree. So I was quite pleasantly uh, surprised, not for the reasons that, that they're doing this, but Apple have delayed their return to corporate offices until 2022 because of COVID cases. Obviously not happy that it's because of COVID cases, but happy that where organizations are trying to make people to come back to offices and and, and go back to uh, a pre-pandemic way of working, it's not happening. And I'm kind of looking around London and I just wondered what your thoughts were on this. I don't see this mass return to the office happening. Yesterday was a Thursday. It was quiet. Mm. And we're like, what, six weeks on from restrictions lifting now? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, so many people just got so used to it, haven't they? Like, And I think if it's like anything, if someone tells you to do something, it's almost like you kind of not rebel, but like it just makes you not want to do it. Whereas if it's more of a relaxed, you know, come back when you want. And, and like you said, you know, people are not sort of necessarily being sort of forced to, you know, to come back in then of course, you know, it is going to just be a more sort of relaxed kind of feel about things. And, and I agree, it's it's a nice atmosphere at the moment in London. It's not overly busy. There's a lot of people obviously still, there is a buzz and there's an atmosphere. And I think at one point that was what was missing. Like there was people coming back into London, but then there was just no atmosphere. It was like eerie almost, like it was weird. So the, now there's a bit of noise and it's, it's starting to pick up. It's good. But yeah, I think companies that are doing this, again, I, I think a lot of people will sort of follow on that really. Yeah. And it's it's a happy it's a happy medium right now. But I, Apple were planning to ask uh, staff to return to offices on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays by early September, with employees able to work able to work remotely for Thursdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, which actually is quite prescriptive. So, I for one, I'm quite pleased that they're not doing that and don't feel able to do that. And I just wondered what everyone else's thoughts are. If anyone's listening, are you happy with the status quo where we are now, where you can go into the office, but people aren't being told that they have to go into an office? Well, I think I think it will change eventually. But then obviously with Christmas on the way and the winter, and case, cases might go up. So it could kind of go back like yeah I don't know it's, it's still sort of the uncertainty of it all isn't it like no yeah. one really knows what's coming no one knows what's going to be a couple of months down the line like six months down the line so um yeah let's just kind of wait and see and see how it goes yeah, nice. yeah exactly well look Amber you're a little fuzzy headed so I'm gonna let you get off this call but thank <laughs> you for joining me on today's podcast have a lovely no weekend and we'll be back on Tuesday thanks